studio again this morning. Apologize for a minute or two of delay. Uh, it appears we have a gremlin in the studio named Cliff this morning. More mm -hmm. on that later, mm -hmm. uh, but we're glad to be with you. Today we have Dr. Ronald Chen, uh, the Chair of Radiation Oncology here at the University of Kansas Cancer Center in studio with us to talk about his research being released today in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The study shows the deficit of cancer screenings across the U.S. during the pandemic. Prepare yourself. It's a huge number that will have implications for a long time, and we'll tackle that next. But first, yeah. Dr. Dana Hawkinson, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, has some numbers to share this morning mm -hmm. as we continue to track COVID-19 admissions and hospitalizations here and in Hayes. Dana? Yeah. Yeah. Again, I think overall in the United States, our, um, our cases are, are going down in general. You know, our numbers in Kansas City mm -hmm. uh, could be better, could be a lot better. Um, hopefully, we'll start to see that, that downward trend. Uh, but here in the hospital, we have 13 active infections with six in the ICU and half of those on a ventilator with three. And then we still have 12 in that recovery period as well. So 25 total patients in the hospital. Hayes uh, has zero active infections and two in that recovery period. So. And let's just take a minute and yeah. talk about Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, the number reported in the star for new cases yeah. was 239. Something about the um, Which that. was the highest since February. Yeah, two months. And uh, the seven-day seven rolling average. averages have continued to increase. We've yep. seen about a 25% increase mm -hmm. in the number of new cases, yeah. average number of new cases per day. Yep over the last two weeks. So not an insignificant change. No, and you know, we have to assume that those are just the cases that are diagnosed right. and those are what are reported. But we have to assume there are other cases out there that are, are not, you know, people aren't going to get tested. Um, of course, asymptomatic spread. We've, we've seen that in our population that's here in the hospital. Yesterday we ran through some numbers of, in our patients and a lot of them were asymptomatic people. And that's just a very concerning thing because we understand the large proportion amount of spread due to asymptomatic spread. I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but uh, before we jump into the rest of our discussion today, are there any reporter questions on the line? Doesn't sound like it. A morning without Cody, wow. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope they're okay. All right. Well, Dr. Chen, let's move into uh, your part of the story today. Congratulations on a study being published uh, today in JAMA. Um, to start, we should be fair with everyone. Uh, some of the details of this study are embargoed until 10 a.m. today. But we do have plenty that we can talk about. And, of course, Dr. Chen is agreeable to answering any uh, media questions later today if there are questions that we can't answer this morning. I'll start with a few questions and we, maybe we can open it up um, to a broader discussion from the community with their questions. So we know that uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic that impacted health care delivery systems forced many clinics to shut down for part of 2020. That meant we canceled appointments and we know this must have had a negative impact on cancer screenings. Tell us what you can about the design of your study and why you think it's important. Yeah, and because of the embargo, I would uh, love to talk about the study, but I can't reveal any specific results until 10 o'clock this morning. But, you know, as a physician, I think we all saw how COVID impacted clinic shutdowns and canceled appointments in 2020, especially when it hit us in March, April, and then we adjusted afterwards. And so I know as a cancer physician that cancer screening was made, uh, impacted in a major way, mm -hmm. especially because the cancellations usually involve healthy patients and mm -hmm. cancer screening involves healthy patients and, and are thought to be non-urgent. And so what we did in this study was to look at national data to see the impact of COVID on cancer screening across the country and to quantify exactly how much screening was missed in men and women in 2020. And I think that's really important information because we need to know how much was missed so we know how much we need to make up this year. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a minute about the importance of screening. So we know that screening tests help catch cancers earlier. Uh, why is it so important to catch cancer earlier? What difference can it make catching a cancer at an earlier stage, say, versus a more advanced stage? Yeah, with um, most of the major cancers we have, breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men, colorectal cancer, uh, there are good screening tests that help us diagnose the cancer at an early stage. 
And the importance of diagnosing cancer at an early stage is that, one, it's the most curable. If you diagnose a cancer at a stage one mm -hmm. versus two mm -hmm. versus three versus four, it's the, the cure rate goes down with a higher stage of cancer. So we want to catch it early so we have the best chance of beating the cancer. The other important thing is that when the cancer is diagnosed a little bit later, the treatment is also harder on the patient as well. So for a stage one cancer, oftentimes maybe we just need surgery or maybe we need radiation. But for a stage three cancer, sometimes we have to add chemo to it. Maybe we need both surgery and radiation. And for stage four cancer, it becomes incurable. And so really, I think for the major cancers we have, prostate, breast, colorectal, the guidelines recommend regular screening so we can catch it as early as possible. And all these screening tests have been shown to, to save lives and improve survival for patients. And I think we all know, uh, even anecdotally from our own experience, mm -hmm. um, and I think at 10 and 10 today, you'll be able to talk more about uh, how your study has proven that there was a major decline in cancer screenings across the country in 2020. Were there any particular patient groups, whether they're disease groups or age groups, um, that were impacted more than others? Yeah, uh, we, that was part of the study that we were very interested in looking at. We just didn't want to look at screening impact, but we want to see if there's any patient groups that would hit harder. And there were a couple of things that we looked at. One, we know that COVID impacted different parts of the country at different times last year. And so we wanted to see whether the cancer screening impact was also following the timing of different regions of the country. So that's one thing that we looked at to see whether there was a bigger impact in the Northeast versus the Midwest versus the West. So that's something that we'd be able to show in this particular study. The other thing that we're really interested in, and it's part of my role as the Associate Director of Health Equity at the Cancer Center, is we wanted to see if there's any equity issues. Did COVID make cancer screening equity better or worse. And so we all know that pre-COVID, uh, certain patient groups were less likely to get cancer screening. And so that related to race, ethnicity, where people lived. And so certain groups of individuals have better rates of screening, and then certain groups did not have. So there's a gap uh, in, in equity of cancer screening. And we wanted to see in 2020 when COVID impacted everybody, whether that gap increased or lessened in terms of cancer screening, so we'll be able to show that in this study as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that might actually be a silver lining from the COVID pandemic, uh, really across healthcare delivery, was uh, the rapid implementation of telehealth. Uh, was there any impact of telehealth on individuals getting cancer screenings? I mean, I think we all know that you really can't do a colonoscopy via telehealth, but there are many other things that, that could have been a benefit from telehealth. Yeah, that was also one of the things that we looked at in this study. I think, again, as you said, telehealth really has been an incredible development uh, in 2020, the rapid development implementation of telehealth so physicians can continue to take care of their patients and provide consultation advice even remotely when the clinics were shut down. So we wanted to see if patients who had access to telehealth had better screening rates, maybe because the physician was able to communicate with them, look, your cancel appointment's canceled, your mammogram's canceled, but we have a plan to reschedule this. So we wanted to see if individuals who had access to telehealth had better upkeep of their screening versus people who didn't have telehealth, and we were able to uh, find some results in that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense conceptually, right? We know that in other industries, uh, an ease of connection, even if that connection is virtual, um, does help uh, keep uh, people moving, whether that's um, towards a specific goal or connected to um, their provider in this case. And so I'll be curious to, to see what you can share. And, and just to speak to that, I mean, I think um, we all, I think as physicians, we all know and have felt the impact of telehealth so that we could sort of mm -hmm. keep up with our patients and provide care. Mm -hmm. But I think we really need more studies to measure the actual impact of telehealth. Did telehealth improve screening? Did telehealth improve patient outcomes? Did telehealth improve diagnosis of certain conditions like cancer? Those studies really need so that we can actually prove or continue to prove the worth of telehealth as we continue going forward. So as you think about a general take home message um, for the viewers out there this morning around your work um, in general and with this study, well, what would you want to make sure everyone knows about the importance of screening and what we do now as it relates to COVID and its impact on cancer? I think the, the really important thing to, to emphasize is that there was a very large gap 
in cancer screening in 2020 because of COVID. Mm -hmm. We knew that. This paper will quantify exactly how big that gap is. But I think the important thing for individuals to take away is that if your screening test, your mammogram, colonoscopy, PSA, if that were canceled back in March or April of last year, and if it has not been rescheduled, we are now a year behind screening. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a long period of time. And, and I think we need to reschedule that ASAP. So whether this, uh, we're now three months behind, six months behind, a year behind for certain individuals, it's really important for individuals with canceled tests to call their providers and reschedule those tests ASAP. I think it's also important for healthcare systems and primary care offices to look back in 2020 to look at the canceled appointments for the cancer for the patients to call them to actively reschedule that as well. I think we need to work together to make up for this gap because I would say there are other studies that have shown that because of the delayed in cancer diagnosis and also delayed in treatment, COVID is actually going to cause an increase in cancer deaths on the order of tens of thousands. And I think that's really important for us to be aware of and try to reduce that, that issue. Yeah. Right. That, that's the impact, right? Tens of thousands of deaths that are either um, would not have been the case mm -hmm. before or happen more rapidly as, a, as it relates to either the impact of COVID on treatment or the impact of COVID on screening. Yeah. All right, well, Jill, let's get to some questions from the community this morning. Yeah, I do want to uh, give a shout out to Donna Pittman with KNBC. I see you're on. Did you have a question? Okay. So, yes, Sherry wants to know, will this, is this true globally? Do you think that the same thing is happening around the globe? I do think so. Uh, so this particular study, uh, we just looked at U.S. data and across the U.S. There are other studies that have come out from Europe, for example, that have also tried to quantify the decreased screening. Uh, and so I do think this happened globally. And so it's really a huge global issue. I think yeah. it's, it's an interesting sort of concept to think about, right? We've talked a lot about the deaths that are directly related to COVID. Patients who are infected end up in the hospital um, or need advanced care and don't survive their infection. But the ripple effects that we've talked about, right, this is a great example. The ripple effects of that um, are really, really hard to wrap your head around. The number is big, um, tens of thousands of deaths, big, right, globally even bigger. Um, and, and I don't think we really know, right, we can understand maybe what that number looks like with cancer in this case, um, but I'm not sure that we really know what it looks like around people who didn't seek care for chronic diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure in quite the same way that they would have before, and then end up with more morbidity, more disease, more advanced disease more quickly from that lack of follow-up. And I think we'll be learning about that probably for a decade. Yeah. Um, and we probably won't really understand what this has meant both here in our community but globally for, for quite some time. And we know that there are larger gaps also in things that are preventable, like mm -hmm. vaccine-preventable diseases. We know those programs around the world got shut down for things like uh, polio, those vaccination programs, other screening things and, and treatment programs for things like tuberculosis and HIV. Huge gaps were formed because of the COVID pandemic as well because those groups and those people just could not get to those areas that needed those programs to be going. Go figure. It's always about infectious disease. I know. With I always bring it around. <laughs> well, you know, it's especially difficult for people who feel healthy. You know, you, you're mm -hmm. healthy. Ah, you miss a mammogram. What's the big deal? Right. But, but that's really the important issue here is that even when you feel healthy, the vaccinations, the screening, whether it's for cancer or other conditions, really need to make that up. All right. Matt wants to know, does one year really make a difference in a cancer diagnosis? Mm, what, what cancers are you most worried about, the, which, which are aggressive? Yeah, the, I, I think that's a really good question. Uh, uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, it's hard to say exactly which cancer is most aggressive because it actually really depends on the individual. There are individuals where their cancers just grow on a very fast pace, whether it's breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer or, or lung cancer. And there are individuals where the cancer grows slowly. So it's really hard to tell on an individual level or on a population level, well, I'll make up for the mammogram, but don't make up for the PSA. It's really hard because the individual biology is different. So, so I, you know, I would say that regular screening for breast, colon, prostate cancer have been shown to save lives uh, uh, on a population level. I would advocate for all of that to be made up. Do you know, Dr. Chen, um, offhand, the number of new cancers that are diagnosed per year based on screenings? 
Uh, I actually do not know, but I, you know, I'm a prostate cancer person, so what I would say is that um, the, you know, on an annual basis, there's probably about 160 to 180,000 men diagnosed with new prostate mm. cancer. Uh, I would say the, the, the vast majority of that, maybe 90%, is diagnosed through screening. screening. Um, I would say also, you know, uh, screening for prostate cancer had been a controversial issue for the past few years. There were some guidelines that came out about six, seven years ago that recommended against screening. So that actually prostate cancer diagnosis dipped. Uh, and then the, the guidelines changed, and now it's coming back up. But also, uh, uh, with new prostate cancer diagnosis because of misscreening, the cancers are now diagnosed at a more advanced stage, which really shows the point that we should not be missing screening, and we really need to keep up with that. And it, and it is really hard, I think, to quantify, but the stories are very real. So I think about um, my time before joining the University of Kansas here. I worked in a different city in an inner city hospital, and we saw all the time in the operating room in the middle of the night people who had advanced colon cancer, who didn't have access to health care, who didn't get screening, and their diagnosis for colon cancer was when their colon burst mm -hmm. and they needed emergency surgery, right? We don't see that very often here. We don't see that very often anymore in general because of the benefit of screening. And a year can make a big difference in an aggressive colon cancer that otherwise might not be caught. I think you're absolutely right. A year can also make a difference between whether the cancer has spread, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is not curable, uh, or before it's spread. So I think this is a really important issue. Rebecca wants to know, if I start Griffin myeloma treatment two weeks after my vaccine, will it wipe out my antibodies? It, I wonder if it was multiple myeloma yeah, uh, and it just got autocorrected. Oh, mm. probably. Damn autocorrect. <laughs> I know. Well, and I'm not a doctor, so I just read what it writes. Yeah. Um, so multiple myeloma. So, you know, uh, what was the, was it after so the if, first yeah, or second dose? If I start the treatment two weeks yeah. after my vaccine, mm -hmm. and she doesn't write whether it's yeah. first or second, maybe you just speak to both. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to weigh, and please weigh in on this, I think you have to weigh risk and benefit. You know, certainly I think two weeks, we know that even with the first dose of vaccine, if, the, if we're talking about the mRNA and the, the two-dose series, you do start to build that immunity with the B cells and T cells, um, antibody responses. Um, but certainly not as optimal as if that second dose. But you also have to weigh what is your risk of progression, if you, as you talked about. Um, so you probably you have to take both of those things into consideration and obviously treat that one that is more um, uh, likely to, to be more harmful, and that would be the myeloma. So certainly get that treatment. Two weeks, though, um, after that first dose, you really do start to make some of those, uh, have that immune response. Again, it's not optimal until probably two weeks after the second, but you have to weigh that uh, versus the benefit of, of treating that myeloma. And it sounds like your medical team is wanting to treat that myeloma much more quickly uh, than waiting for that second dose, waiting two weeks after that second dose. I think this is a great reminder that right there are some theoretical answers that mm -hmm. make sense based on how the vaccines work or how the treatment works, but it's very hard for us to provide specific answers to those questions without being part of your treatment team. Um, there's a very, very good reason why all of our uh, treating oncologists at the Cancer Center are very involved in determining treatment plans, when vaccines happen in those cycles, and how we make sure that there's uh, as little impact as possible between vaccination and ongoing treatment uh, to make sure that the timing is appropriate for you. So uh, question is a great one. I think right, theoretically we understand how both those treatments work. The specific answer for you, of course, is make sure to have that conversation. Ask those questions very, very deliberately of your treatment team. And I would also be, you know, depending on what your, uh, your diagnosis is, myeloma, you know, we don't know how well your immune system is working mm -hmm. in general, so you have to get that, that cancer treated so that you can then develop a more of a robust immune system. The, again, the downfall, the side effects from the vaccine are practically nil, but the benefit is certainly great and the possible benefit is great. So certainly uh, I would say if that is what's, uh, what your medical team wants you to do and get that treated, I would certainly get it treated. Maggie has a similar question about radiation and the impact of it on the efficacy of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And she wants to know what you are recommending to your patients in that regard. Yeah, we recommend that our patients get the vaccine. Uh, I think uh, 
depends on the type of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, most cancers treated with radiation, there's not a huge impact on the immune system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think that the patient should be able to proceed with radiation. We also encourage all of our patients to get the vaccine. I, I would say in general as well, right, we know, as, as Dr. Hawkinson just mentioned, that the risks really of this vaccine are, are very, very, very low uh, in either of these vaccines compared to the efficacy. And even if something in your treatment plan, regardless of your disease, whether it's cancer related or whether it's an autoimmune disease, um, right? If, if there is a reduction in the efficacy of the vaccine in your specific circumstance related to your disease or your treatment, it is still better to have that slightly reduced mm -hmm. benefit than none. Uh, the risk of COVID far, far outweighs the risk of a reduced benefit yeah. from the vaccine. So. While it might not be 94 or 95% as described in your specific circumstance, it still will be better than mm -hmm. not having the vaccine. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Diane says, I mentor breast cancer patients and they were very distraught at the onset of the pandemic. Coupling a new diagnosis with a slowdown in surgeries caused more mm -hmm. stress than usual. Mm -hmm. Do you think this unusual time will cause any changes in these patients' prognosis over the long haul? Mm -hmm. I, I hope not. Uh, I know what we did here in the breast program, and actually in, in all the cancers, it, it, there certainly was an impact on surgery, mm -hmm. uh, and we had to make decisions uh, on which patients could safely delay, delay cancer mm -hmm. surgery in March and April of last year. And a lot of times what we did in those patients is we thought about whether they could start with other treatments before surgery. So for breast cancer, some women could start hormone therapy before surgery, which would sort of control the cancer and even start to treat it before surgery if it had to be delayed. Some patients could start radiation for other cancers before surgery. Some patients could start uh, chemotherapy. And so uh, hopefully with the plan that was made for each patient, uh, even if a surgery had to be delayed, either it was safe or something happened before it to try to minimize the impact. Isaac wants to know, what's the effect of the new proton therapy will have on can cancer survival rates? Well, I, I would say, so first of all, I'm incredibly excited about mm -hmm. the upcoming proton center. It's a huge achievement for the health system and the cancer center. And uh, it, uh, we, we anticipate starting to treat patients early in 22, so early next year. The, the, the important thing about protons is that because it's able to target the tumor, uh, better and therefore reduce some of the dose to other organs, really the major impact on cancer patients will be reducing side effects and improving quality of life. And, and that's something that we really look, look forward to. Uh, there are certain conditions, uh, certain, for example, pediatric cancers where protons are certainly known to be better. Uh, and there are certain conditions where there's a lot of clinical trials to try to compare with other forms of treatment. And we'll be involved in all of that. Mm -hmm. Kathy wants to know, why are the results of this study being held up on an announcement until 10 a.m. today? And also, how can someone hear the results and more information on this study? Yes, so uh, the reason it's being held up is because the study is officially being published at 10 a.m. by the journal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so until the studies are re officially released, we can't actually uh, uh, release the results. But, but there actually has been uh, quite a bit of media attention. Uh, and so there will be some uh, news articles coming out at, at about 10 o'clock uh, as well. And, and also, we'd be happy to take additional questions related to that after 10. Right. And at 11, we'll do a summary. And we're going to link and include the numbers in the summary, which we will send to all media. So hmm. the media that are listening today and they get this, yeah. then, then they can turn around and share it with their audiences. Jamie wants to know how many of our new admissions for COVID have been vaccinated? So um, I don't know that I have a total yeah. number. Um, we have today in-house one of yeah. our admitted mm -hmm. patients who is more than two weeks after yeah the second dose of the vaccine series. Um, this is actually probably the first patient that I'm aware of that had significant symptoms. Um, and um, so that's new for us, although as we've talked about at length, the vaccine efficacy at 94, 95 percent, as we saw in all of the studies, and even maybe even a little bit greater than that, um, means that there will be people, right, with the primary endpoint of hospitalization and severe disease, 94 or 95 percent of those that were vaccinated did not have those things, did not have severe disease 
or need hospitalization, but some will. And so this is not unanticipated, it's not unexpected. Um, we've not seen any different, maybe even actually a lower percentage than, than we would expect from those studies as far as patients having severe enough disease to need hospitalization. So I think the best answer that I have to that question for you is we're seeing exactly the benefit of vaccine that we would expect and we would continue to encourage anyone who's not yet received the vaccine to go get it because it does absolutely have an impact. Just think, right? It wasn't that long ago we were talking about hundreds of acute patients in the hospital. And today we're talking about tens. And we have been talking about 10 or thereabout for at least a month now, mm -hmm. probably two. It all runs together. Yeah, I think what we need to talk about is what we aren't seeing. Mm -hmm. And we have, I think, one patient over 70. Uh, after that, we don't have any. We don't have any nursing facility patients. So that's what we aren't seeing. And we know those are the most vulnerable yeah. for severe disease, hospitalization, and death. So, and, and we also know that those are the most vaccinated groups. That's exactly right. And because so of the vaccine, works. we aren't seeing those groups. So they are keeping them. The vaccine is keeping those that population, those groups out of the hospital. So um, Lee wants to know, this is kind of a little complicated or hard for me to say it, but hmm. if the vaccine is not helping prevent the spread, is 95% effective to, well, that's a question. Does it help present, mm -hmm. prevent the spread? Mm -hmm. Because the concern is, is it ever gonna go away? Yeah. Is the virus ever gonna go I understand. away? understand. So what does the 95% pr protect? Well, so those, those numbers, the 94 and 95% efficacy, were the primary endpoints in the studies uh, that were used uh, by the vaccine developers to seek emergency use authorization. What that means is that there were primary endpoints of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Uh, and the reason that those were chosen as primary endpoints is because they're very easy to see. Right? You don't need to do testing of everyone vaccinated to see if they have severe disease or need to be in the hospital. There are ongoing studies to look at just the question you're asking. Does vaccination prevent asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic disease? And does vaccination prevent transmission in those cases? And the early evidence is very promising that the reduction in transmission and the reduction in asymptomatic or mild disease is also significant. Whether that's 70% or 95%, we will probably know more over the course of the next few months. But that study requires people to volunteer after they've been vaccinated to be tested on a regular basis, daily or weekly, even if they have no symptoms. And so it takes us a little bit of time to gather that population, enough people and enough results to know exactly what this looks like, especially as we need to understand as well the impact of reduction in disease in the community compared to say November when we started vaccinating people. So lots of variables in there. Um, I think we can't tell you with certainty what the number is mm -hmm. like we can for severe disease or death as far as the reduction in transmission or mild or asymptomatic disease. But we know from the early data in those studies that it looks just as promising um, as the impact on those more severe outcomes. So I hope that answers the question. I think at the, I think at the end of the day, what, the, what people want to know is, is this ever going to go away yeah. and how does vaccination help yeah. that? Yeah. Well, yeah, so the answer is that is in our control, 100%, right? Everyone needs to be vaccinated. This goes away when we get enough immunity in the population over a long period of time to stop transmission so that there is a break in the cycle and there is no new variant related to mutations at the time of replication, viral replication, when new people are infected. And we know that 40% is not enough. But just as you said, you know, there are good data signals, early data signals um, suggesting, and which, which show in real world experiences, but also uh, in, in laboratory quantifying viral load, that you do have a reduction in asymptomatic disease and also, so therefore, probably transmission as well. So that is real world data from Israel, also data from here in the United States with healthcare workers, showing that a majority of the healthcare workers, if they continue to get it, it's due to not, not between um, healthcare workers themselves, mm -hmm. but because of other uh, instances out in the community. There's also um, laboratory data looking and showing that people who have gotten vaccinated 
do have reduced viral, viral loads in their upper respiratory tract. So again, there are caveats to those studies, but it certainly does show vaccinated versus unvaccinated, showing that you can have a lower risk or a lower viral load. Therefore, lower viral, viral loads lend to lower transmission. So those early data signals are out there that you actually do have reduced transmission in those vaccinated people. And Dana brings up two great points. Dr. Chen is uh, uh, equally interested in population health and may have some comment on this as well. But when we look at established populations where we know we have reached a threshold of vaccination that's say 80% or more, whether that be populations here in the United States like healthcare delivery systems, us included, right, where we've reached that target, or we're talking about populations like the country of Israel, where the overall population has been in, uh, vaccinated more than 80%, regardless of previous infection, regardless of sort of individual concerns, right? They've reached a point where they got to 80% vaccinated. They've seen a dramatic reduction in the spread of disease. In fact, very little disease in those vaccinated. So we've got the same proof here in our population. Healthcare systems across the country have that proof in their populations. Um, if the question is, what is the role in vaccination in getting us out of this thing? It is population-based immunity, or what people talk about as herd-based immunity. And there is proof after proof after proof um, in different looking groups, different populations, right? Whether they're health, they are healthcare workers or the country of Israel or other populations in our country and across the globe who have reached that threshold, there is proof that that work, right? Getting people vaccinated and establishing population-based immunity is what gets us out of this thing. I don't know. Dr. Chen, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think this is really a great question and a great mm -hmm. discussion. I mean, I, I would also frame the question to, to say, what is this? When, what is this going away? I would say this is being very scared of a deadly virus that's killing people and putting them in the hospitals mm -hmm. and ICUs. And I would say this is, because of that fear, shutting down our, uh, our, our normal function, daily life. Uh, and I would say that if the population is vaccinated and we now we would have 95 per percent protection against those severe consequences, this goes away. This in terms of being afraid of the virus, this in terms of the shutdown across the country will go away. And we're seeing that already. We're seeing some of the openings slowly as, as vaccination gets, gets happening. And I think this is really important. And I think vaccination will help us get back to normalcy. Okay, two or three more questions. You have time? Okay. Joyce wants to know, when we say see X percentage of Americans have received the vaccine, is that percentage based on the total U.S. population? In general, yes. Um, and the reason I say that is uh, borders, right, between states um, are effectively artificial as it pertains to disease transmission. Um, there's not a wall that you build around a county or a city or a state. And so when we're talking about that percentage, um, it really is the percentage in any particular population. But as we're talking about how do we get out of this sort of as a country, um, yes, it's the United States as a whole, the total population. But remember, the borders to our country are effectively artificial as it relates to disease transmission as well, because people, uh, it's very easy for people to travel from country to country. And so um, there's a very, very important conversation here about the need to globally get 80% of the population vaccinated, the total population, including countries that normally um, have uh, more difficulty or a larger sort of gap between their access to health care as compared to, say, us or Europe. Um, uh, there's a lot to unpack in that conversation as well, because the majority of vaccines in the world still have been administered, or the largest percentage, mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. out of proportion to our percent of the population in the world, have happened here in the United States. So we have conversations about getting people vaccinated here in the United States. There are likely different reasons for not being vaccinated than, say, getting people vaccinated in Africa, but both are, both are very, very important in the big picture. I think we also need to include pediatrics in there. That's why it's going to be so important to get that pediatric data and having the ability to get them vaccinated uh, when and if, which I believe it will be, when and if it, it, it's shown to be safe and efficacious. All right. And we have um, a couple of more questions. Jean wants to know, how old is the positive patient who is vaccinated? 
60s. 60s. Yeah, 60s. Yeah. And Jennifer wants to know, last question, I think we're missing the college crowd, and they don't really listen mm -hmm. to the news, but rather yeah. word of mouth, which is usually misinformed. How do we reach them? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually doing a lot of work with a number of different universities, community colleges, um, uh, higher education institutions, both here in Kansas City and really across uh, the state and region to understand what the impact is there and how to better um, manage that problem. There are really, really impactful things happening on many college campuses right now, especially as the um, inventory for vaccine has increased, that um, many universities are trying before the end of the semester to get everyone who's on campus vaccinated before they leave and go back to their home. Uh, because they are, in effect, a captive audience. It's easy to, to sort of catch them there. And very much the personal interaction is better, say, uh, better received in that population than um, maybe what we're saying here um, on, on this program. So um, there are definitely efforts underway to address exactly the question um, that you pose. I think it's a great one. Um, it, it, you know, we're, we're working with, I said, a number of different places on all kinds of outside the box ideas to address specifically that problem. Um, the same is actually true in high schools. Uh, Children's Mercy is doing an excellent job of getting into high schools before the semester is over and getting vaccination accomplished for those 16 and over in a number of districts across um, uh, across the metro. They're working with those districts, the, the school nurses and the other resources in the district. So it's not Children's Mercy necessarily taking the burden, but working to support those things. Our friend uh, Dr. Watts uh, actually was, was very gracious to share a lot of details with a group of, of us last night about those, yeah, yesterday, about those specific efforts. So we are working hard as a healthcare delivery system across our metro and across the region to address every bit of those things that we can because we know that 16 to 18 population is very likely to interact with a number of people their age mm -hmm. and of course parents grandparents mm -hmm. others as we as we get into the summer all right okay, yeah i think we, we we continue to have a lot of questions tomorrow um, tune tomorrow. in again and we will add them to our list thank you yes also tomorrow dr kevin kevin alt uh, an obstetrician here at the health system and a member of the CDC Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, or ACIP, as we mention often, joins us again to answer questions about the panel's decision to allow Johnson & Johnson vaccines to resume with a warning. He was one of the 10 members of the panel who voted in favor of continuing, uh, four voted against, and one member abstained. We'll get to also answer questions that we didn't get to during the week, as Jill just mentioned. Um, that, that leaves us with a very full agenda tomorrow. So as we wrap up today, Dr. Chen, any final thoughts? Get vaccinated, get cancer screening. Mm -hmm. There you go, nice and easy. Yeah. Dr. Hawkinson. I'll be a little bit more uh, loquacious with that. But, you know, all the wealth <laughs> in the world doesn't matter. And we see people who uh, have wealth and riches every day in the hospital. There's nothing more important than your health. There's no more important gift you can give to yourself or your loved ones or your children than health. So please, uh, I just had a friend, my buddy Chris, in, for his upcoming birthday, had to get his colonoscopy. Hell of a birthday present. I understand that. <laughs> but do that because down the road, it will pay off and you will be more healthy. So get your cancer screenings for, for your loved ones, for your children. Talk to their pediatricians. Get those vaccines. Get those vaccines for vaccine-preventable diseases but also uh, vaccine-preventable cancers, like cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Get the HPV vaccine. Please do that. Talk with your medical providers. Get your screenings and get your vaccines. Yeah, great points. You know, I'll uh, expand just a little bit on, on the Children's Mercy conversation. One of the other things uh, that really came to light yesterday, there's a great article in The Star um, about the impact of pediatric patients now showing up in pediatric practices for the first time really in the last year or so in mass with respiratory symptoms. Um, and the challenge that pediatricians are facing in getting parents to agree to test children with symptoms that might be related to COVID. And the reasons are many, but they often relate to, I don't wanna to have to quarantine our house while we're waiting on a test or if, if they're positive, or my other child has a soccer tournament this weekend and won't be able to play, or I don't want my kids to not be able to go to school while we're waiting on a result, or if it is COVID. 
And while those impacts are very real and we all understand them, um, we also are finding ourselves in situations more and more now where we don't have a complete picture of where disease is spreading in our communities. And that means we can't be active in fighting that transmission and stopping it. And so this is actually an active plea to anyone who has symptoms, right? If you don't feel well, please get tested. Most won't be COVID and we know that. We know that the, the disease transmission in our community now is lower than it was several months ago in November or December. And we know that allergies and the common cold and all kinds of things are going around but we still have a very, very important benefit of getting tested and understanding whether you've been vaccinated or not. Knowing that the risk right, of those that are vaccinated is extremely low, it still helps us understand what's happening. Still gives us information that we need to make sure that we can get out of this and keep everyone safe. So please, as, as hard as those impacts may be on, um, on life and as tired as we all are of dealing with them, if you or your children or a loved one have symptoms, please get tested and of course, in the meantime, Get your vaccination wherever and whenever you can, and uh, don't don't miss out on your cancer screening. So, with that, we'll wrap up for the day. But first, April is National Donate Life Month. I'm actually proudly wearing my Donate Life ribbon pin. Um, if you don't know, my actual area of clinical interest and expertise is in anesthesia for transplantation, and the gift of life is something everyone can decide to do. If you want to be a donor, of course, register when you get your license, but more importantly, make sure that you talk it over with your family as they will be the ones to make sure that your wishes are carried out if that time comes, like it did unexpectedly for David Reynolds. As we say goodbye, we honor David with this story. Sweetheart, <laughs> there's my girl. Hey. Where are you? It's a reunion that was never meant to happen. But what these two didn't realize at the time is this would be one of their last hugs before the pandemic hit. They were brought together by fate. To begin this story, we start where it ended at the Ozark Memorial Cemetery in Joplin, Missouri. We had more time to be alone with our own thoughts and that was rough. With COVID, it forced us to face those. It's been a year since that hug, and since we first met Amanda Reynolds. She comes here to remember. Jayliana loves coming here. The youngest one, she calls it her daddy bench. Jayliana's dad was David Reynolds. He was murdered in a road rage shooting in 2018. For Amanda, though, it's this man who helps keep the memory of David alive. It's some kind of special. There's not a word for it. David Shell, better known as Spider, suffered nearly two decades of heart problems that led to heart failure in 2018. He had what's called ventricular tachycardia, which is basically a short circuiting uh, of a rhythm problem in the heart muscle itself. The first time I met Spider, I'm walking into his room saying, hi, I'm Dr. Sauer, you need a heart transplant. You're waiting and you're waiting and you think, is this gonna be reality? And all of a sudden, boom. It's reality. While Spider lie dying of heart failure at the University of Kansas Health System, 160 miles south in Joplin, 27-year-old David Reynolds lie dying of a gunshot wound to the head. He said, we just want to prepare you for what's going to happen. David, an organ donor, was about to give the ultimate gift, his heart. Then the time came and they, uh, they had to call it this time of death, <laughs> and that was literally the hardest time of my life. While Spider waited, Amanda said goodbye. I just put my head on his chest. I listened to his heart, knowing that I was gonna go help someone else. And she was right. I'm proud to carry that heart. I'm proud to carry this family. And it's something I'll carry <laughs> to the best of my ability for the rest of my life. He's my family now. She's my hero. Her family is my hero, and she's right. We're, we're family. Spider is able to keep a piece of David alive. A part of him is still out there. I feel like he rides on my shoulder every day. You know, I feel like I'm in good hands with the Lord and David right there.